Welcome to QAPI for Wound Care, a practical guide for quality assurance and performance improvement. Thank you for joining the webinar today. We'll get started. First, we'd like to do is introduce our distinguished faculty. We're so pleased that they're able to join us here today. So our first presenter, I'd like to introduce you to Michelle Sturkey. Michelle is, is the Chief Nursing Officer for New Care Services. And you probably know New Care as they run multiple long-term care facilities across various states in the United States. Michelle has a long history of working in the long-term care setting uh, at locations previous to New Care. And she also has some experience in working in the acute care setting as well. We're really pleased to have Michelle with us today because she brings practical experience from the nursing home perspective about doing QAPI programs. Also joining us today is our speaker, Ann Schurig. Ann Schurig is the Vice President of Clinical Operations for Wound Rounds. And Wound Rounds is the sponsor of today's webinar. Um, Ann comes to Wound Rounds with a long history in wound ostomy continence nursing, where she's certified in that discipline. And more than that, she's also a luminary in the field of wound ostomy continence nursing, having served as the past president of the Northern Illinois chapter of the association and having practiced as the former editor of its newsletter. So we're really pleased to have our distinguished faculty joining us today for this webinar and hope that you will enjoy getting practical applications for QAPI in your own facility. Having said that, we'd like to turn the webinar over to our faculty. At this point, I'd like to ask Ann Shurik to join in and review the objectives of today's webinar. Ann, please take it away. Thanks, Deb, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Because we're giving CEUs, we're going to read through our objectives so everyone is clear on what we're going to achieve. Uh, first, we're going to try to understand the quality process and how it varies from our traditional quality assurance or QA programs that we've done in the past. We're going to identify the 12 steps that are required to implement a quality plan um, within your organization or your facility. And it's determine the ideal quality team members. Now, this key components of a root cause analysis that may be a new concept or term for some of our listeners. And we're going to understand the steps to execute a performance improvement plan or process, also known as a PIP. So what do we know at this point about QAPI or QAPI? QAPI is part of the Affordable Care Act, and therefore CMS has been charged with a few tasks. Uh, one is developing a prototype program for QAPI and establishing the standards for the program for nursing homes. Uh, they're also being charged with providing technical assistance as well as uh, teaching guides and um, implementation tools for nursing homes to use in implementing their QAPI program. There currently is a 17-home four-state demonstration project that started in September of 2011 and will conclude in August of this year. Once the uh, uh, feedback from that demonstration project has been collated, the regulations will be finalized and posted by CMS. And once the regulations are in place, uh, there will be a final ruling on when all nursing homes will have to comply. It's projected that will be sometime in or after the first quarter of 2014. So why QAPI? Well, QAPI is more of a philosophy than just a program or a plan. Um, it looks more to be data-driven uh, than any program that's been implemented in the past. And this message of being data-driven is going to be one that you'll hear often in this webinar and uh, you need to pay attention to. One of the other key changes is that the objective is to be proactive, not reactive. We want to prevent adverse events, promote safety and quality, and reduce the risk to our residents as well as to our caregivers within our facilities and organizations. Rather than looking for bad apples and pointing fingers, uh, performance is going to be measured uh, so that it can report the good job that organizations are doing in sustaining quality measures. The focus is also on continuous improvement, and it is, yes, data-driven. And Michelle will speak to these topics in a few minutes. Uh, the information on this slide of what is QAPI and how does it differ from quality assurance in the past, this is going to be on your post-test, so you might want to pay attention here. These are some key points to keep in mind as we move forward. Let's look at the difference between what we've traditionally done and what we're planning to do and how we need to refocus our attention. 
Historically, our QA programs looked at compliance with standards through inspection. It was a rearview mirror. We looked at this as a requirement oftentimes, and we were more reactive in our approach to quality assurance. Uh, many people felt that the responsibility fell on the medical provider and a few key members within that provider, you know, the people who were, quote, on the QA team. Uh, QAPI is different in that it focuses on preventing adverse events through continuous quality improvement. We want to be continually working to raise the standard of care within our organization. The focus is on process and systems, not individuals. And rather than focusing on just the provider, the focus is now on the provider, on resident care, and everyone within an organization is part of the copy process. So what is QAPI? Well, it's quality assurance combined with performance improvement. QA plus PI is QAPI. By engaging all your team members at all levels, of resident care and getting residents and families involved and using the data, there's that word again, data, that's available to us, we can take a more proactive approach to improvement and that's the key objective. Shortly, Michelle's going to discuss how team members will work to identify opportunities for improvement, address gaps in your systems or processes, develop and implement improvement or corrective plans, and continuously monitor what is working and what is not working so that the plan can be adjusted and moved to another goal. Many organizations are already performing key components of QAPI, so don't get overwhelmed, don't get discouraged. This new approach builds on the existing quality assurance and assessment regulations that we've followed for years. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide and the ones to follow, so take your time and work through them, but you're already partly there, I'm sure. This is one of those wordy slides, so take your time when you get your handouts and read through it slowly, but I'm going to focus on the key messages of this slide. And it starts with involving the whole care team. You want to get everyone in your facility involved so that you can not only improve resident care and the resident experience, but also caregiver and uh, environment and safety. Involve the residents and the family members so that their goals and objectives for a healthy, happy experience within your facility can be best met. Get to the root cause of issues through root cause analysis and get to the root cause so that you can solve those problems at hand instead of just putting a band-aid on them. Use your, here it comes again, data to inform, inform your performance improvement process or plan and monitor and adjust your plan through feedback from your team members as well as your residents so that you can continuously improve. Where is CMS at in the process just now? Well, a questionnaire was issued in 2012 to get input on what barriers might be in place currently that would uh, prevent people from implementing a QAPI program. CMS wanted to know what the challenges might be and how they could be overcome. And they are very proud of the fact that they got a 71% response to this questionnaire. This shows that everyone is really interested in this topic in one way or another. And a 71% uh, response is terrific since an average response to survey is somewhere between 20 and 50%. CMS plans to use these responses to shape the program and shape the tools that are they, they are charged with providing, as I mentioned in slide one. They're using 2013 to complete that process, and we're waiting for the final directives to be posted. Now in June, there was a, a notice sent out by CMS saying that they were updating their site, and really what they said was, we're updating our site and look at our site for the updating of our site. So there's not a whole lot of new information. What you will find there is the Quapi at a Glance tool, the draft documents that are currently posted on the CMS website, and some of those documents and tools will be presented in our program today. So what more can we expect from CMS? What's coming? CMS is working with consumer groups to develop uh, family materials as well as facility materials. They're working to develop new survey or training materials and tools that are focused on QAPI. And indications are that surveyors will be looking for a QAPI process in your facility. If there's a problem and you do not have a plan to address it, that's much worse than if you have a problem and you are already addressing it and have a plan in place. Surveyors will also look to know that all your staff 
know and are involved in quasi, and it's not just an administrative function. And they're also going to be looking for active involvement from your medical director. This is an important message, and there's more to come on this topic as Michelle develops out her part of the program in a minute. So where do you start? Well, there are five basic building blocks to the QAPI program. There's the design and scope, developing your governance and leadership, getting feedback, data, 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 and monitoring, putting in place your PIP or performance improvement plans or projects, and then providing systematic analysis and systematic action. If you focus on these five blocks, you're going to build a strong and effective program. So next, Michelle is going to share a practical step-by-step -step approach on how she and her organization have implemented an effective QAPI program following the steps outlined by CMS. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Sturkey. Thank you, Anne. I think Anne has given you a really great framework for why we need to do the QAPI process and how we need to approach it as an organization. And now we're going to see if we can drill down um, to the specific steps of the QAPI process. When you look at this slide and you see that there are 12 steps involved and you realize all the other things that you have to do daily as an administrator or as a DON, you may be thinking to yourself, how am I ever going to accomplish this with everything I have to do? But as we go through each of these steps, you will realize that much of it you're already doing and much of it, once you incorporate it into your day-to-day -day activities, will actually make your job easier. So being new at Quapi is like having a new cell phone. You have to set up your data. You have to set up your app. And the more you work on it, the more you practice with it, the easier it becomes. And pretty soon, it's going to be as easy to do the Quapi process as it is to uh, tweet or text the person next to you. So the first step in the Quapi process is leadership responsibility and accountability. Whether you're in a multi-chain organization or a single organization, the buy-in from the top is really necessary. In a multi-chain organization, your CEO, your chief clinical um, folks, your CFO, your CIO, all need to have a buy-in to the QAPI process and be able to provide you with the resources and the time that you're going to be able to do this. And at the building level, it's an administrative and DON buy-in that needs to occur. Quapi is not a nursing, um, is not a nursing tool. Quapi is not a nursing process, but it's a facility-wide process that needs to have buy-in from everyone. The third most important person that needs to buy into the Quapi process is your medical director. The medical director needs to take an active participatory role in your QIPI process in both identifying opportunities as well as identifying solutions. You would, should be meeting with your medical director on at least a weekly basis to talk about positives that he's seen as well as the challenges that the medical director has seen so that we can get their active involvement in the process. Um, consider changing your medical director's role to the QAPI medical director because in this way they will understand how important the QAPI role is. The next thing you want to do is develop an effective team. Now we all like to sit down and we go, okay, we have to get a group of people together to do this. Let's pick the same five people we always do because we know they'll get it done. While that is often the easiest way to get it done, it's really not going to help you move QAPI throughout the organization. I like to think of my Quapi team or any team that I do as my poo corner team. Everybody on your Quapi team has an important role and has a certain characteristic. So you need a piglet who's scared of everything that you're going to do. You need an Eeyore who sits there and goes, this isn't going to work. Of course we failed. No big surprise. You need a analytical owl. You need a Tigger who's just so excited all the time, not really sure what we're doing, but really excited about being part of the team. You need a Christopher Robin who's going to calmly bring them all together. You need a Rabbit who's going to make sure that every step along the way is organized. And you need a few Pooh Bears who are going to come and be happy and do whatever you need them to do. And if you get a team like that, you're going to be able to take Quapi and you're going to be able to install it throughout the organization. The next thing you want to do is look at your Quapi assessment tool. 
Now, the first time most people fill out, look at this quality assessment tool, they want it, the natural inclination is to go through and say, yeah, we're doing all this, we're great, we're great, we're great. But you want to take a step back and look at the areas on here where you might be challenged. Quality is a very new process, and it's really important to be honest. And if there's areas that you need to work on, that's great. And that's what I would expect to see. And not only have your administrative team fill it out, but also the folks on your coffee committee. So that they also, you can also see where your committee members are. Some of them, if they've been doing this for a while, might be further along. If you've got some new members of the team, there might be some mentoring and coaching you need to do to get them up to where um, the rest of the team is. The next thing you want to do is set up your guiding principles. Most organizations have a mission statement. Most organizations have a vision statement. Now is the opportunity to relook at that mission and vision statement and pull quality into that. Most of our statements have something about delivering quality care, but what does that mean? Get your staff involved. See if they can explain to you what the mission or vision of your organization is. And maybe hold a contest so that your staff can come up with what they view um, the mission and vision of your organization is. You want to make it simple. You don't want to have a 12 paragraph center vision statement, and you want to make sure that every level of your staff understands it. Then you want to develop your plan. It's really important the first time you go to Quapi to make sure that people feel comfortable pointing out the challenges that you may have in your building. Quapi is a no fault um, system. Quapi is a place where people can be open and honest about the challenges that you are seeing on the floor. And if you can get a, a, uh, your group to really, really talk about what the issues are, you're going to have a much more successful process. You might want to think about rewarding you know, the top two Quapi ideas that your staff come up with just so you can show folks the importance of a no-fault, no-blame organization. The next thing you want to do is set up those areas that you've identified into high-risk, high-frequency, high-risk, low-frequency, low-risk, low-frequency, and high-risk, low-frequency. And you need to do this individually based on what's going on in your building. So for instance, Tracheostomies might be a very high-risk, high-frequency um, patient in some buildings, in some buildings with, who have a vet unit or a respiratory therapy department. It might be a high-risk or it might be a lower-risk, high-frequency area. Meal complaints may be a low-frequency, um, low-risk area for some folks. For some folks, if they have a lot of weight loss in their building, it may be a high-risk, high-frequency. So you need to take the ideas and the issues that you come up with and rank them based on what's going on in your facility. And then you want to, you want to have a Quapi awareness campaign. As Ann said multiple times, Quapi is not something that the administrator and DON and the medical director do behind closed doors. Quapi is something we want our residents involved in. Quapi is something we want our families involved in and something we want all of our staff from the night shift laundry person to the administrator to be involved in. So maybe get Pete your champion buttons that say, ask me about Quapi. Maybe you want to um, take the person who comes up with the Quapi, uh, first Quapi idea, get them a pen that says, I'm a Quapi star. Put, um, post your Quapi progress in the break room so everyone understands what's going on in your uh, facility newsletter, talk to the families about the fact that you're starting on your quasi journey. Put it, bring it up in resident council so your residents can have input. The more people are talking about it, the better you'll be. And then we're going to collect data. As Ann had said, data, data, data. But how are we going to collect data? And I think one of the things that we've done really well in our old QI process is the fact that we have collected data. And here's an opportunity to really um, make more of the data we've collected. Look at your resident and family concern forms. Look at your clinical areas. Um, what are your hospital partners asking you to collect? And how can you provide them with better data? Look at your QMs um, that you get from public health. 
Do you have a citation? Certainly that's going to give you something to QI. And then look at your technology system. Do you have an electronic risk system that gives you some trends? Do you have um, an EMR system that's going to give you trends? Use all that to collect the data. And then figure out what you're going to do with that data. Because we're going to collect all this data and we're going to find out maybe that we have multiple, multiple issues in the facility. And just like we were overwhelmed at that 12 step slide, we're going to be really overwhelmed with what we've discovered. So what do we do with this data? Well, let's analyze it. Let's figure out what's more important to our, the overall health of our organization. And let's look at that. Let's also look at some stuff that might be easy wins or easy fixes. We certainly want Quapi to be a successful product. And if the first system or the first issue we take to tackle is very, very complex, very multifactorial, and is going to take a long time to see any movement in that, it's going to be difficult to do that as the first Quapi product uh, project because you're not going to get, see those successes and people are going to get discouraged. So let's pick a couple of products, uh, a couple of processes. Let's look at what we're doing. And then let's set some realistic goals. You want to set goals. You don't want to set a goal that you're going to reduce your, all your falls and all your buildings to zero in one month. That's probably not realistic. So set some short-term incremental steps and goals so that your facility can have some successes along the way. Then we're going to set some benchmarks. Now, again, if you're part of a multi-chain organization, somebody's probably already looked at the literature and set some benchmarks for your organization. There's certainly benchmarks on nursing home compare. Um, there's benchmarks in the literature that talk to you about where you're going to be. But you also want to set some of your own personal benchmarks so that if you're better than the national average or you're better than your company benchmarks, Make that benchmark lower so that you can have a goal that you can reach. And then you're going to develop your performance improvement plan. Each performance improvement plan is the opportunity to take all that data we've gathered, figure out what's going on in your building, and put a plan together. A lot of folks, when they put together their performance improvement plan, do a great job of coming up with a plan and do a great job of the doing but they forget to stop, study what we've done, and see if it's actually making a difference. So the important thing to do with your performance improvement plan is to constantly be reevaluating where you're at, looking to see if you're meeting your benchmarks, looking to see if you're going in the direction you want your organization to go, and then modifying the plan to make sure that you're on the right direction and then start all over again. The other thing that you want to make sure that you do with your PIP plans is not have a building with doing 20 PIP plans at one time. There's no way that people are not going to feel overwhelmed or discouraged if you have 20 PIPs going on. So create one or two PIP plans and work those well before you go to something else. First PIP um, group you have, you probably are going to want your administrator or DON to sit on so that the team learns how to do a PIP and you keep people going in the right direction. But eventually those PIP plans should be made up of your line staff, some department head staff, um, possibly depending on the issue, residents and families. But every PIP plan does not need to have the administrator or DON. The other important thing with your PIP plan is you don't want your PIP to go on and on and on and on. You want your PIP plan to have short, attainable goals so you can reach your end goal. So don't have a PIP plan going on for 10 years. Have a PIP plan that meets those short goals and then continue to move on. There are many ways to get to the root cause of developing uh, for developing your PIP. And root cause analysis basically is trying to get to the real issue of the problem. Um, you know, it's sort of like talking to your three-year-old when they say, Mom, why is, the sun up in, why is the sun up in the sky? Because it's day. Well, why is it day? Because the way that's how the earth rotates. Well, why does the earth rotate that way? And they keep asking why, 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 till they either wear you down 
or you come up with the answer that they're looking for. And that's the same thing with root cause analysis. Regardless of the way that you do it, whether it's flow charts, fishbone diagrams, you're asking that why, why, why to you get to the root of the problem. The, the challenge that most people have is when they identify a problem, everybody thinks they know what the answer is, and so we, we put the solution around that, but we don't really figure out what the root cause of that is. One of the things um, that um, we're going to be showing you in the next slide is a fishbone diagram, which is one way you can do a root cause analysis. When you do your root cause analysis, it's much like a brainstorming session. So you bring your team together, your PIP team together, and you say, okay, we've determined that we have a problem with, let's say, acquired pressure ulcers, as we did. Okay, team, what are we going to, why do we think we have acquired pressure ulcers? And everyone around the table it's to throw out an idea of why you have an acquired pressure ulcer. Now, the first time you do this, it takes a while, because most people are going to sit there and not want to say anything. But as the um, time progresses and the more that you can make sure that people know it's a no-blame environment, you're going to get a lot of great suggestions. Then what I would do is I would take that fishbone diagram where you wrote all your reasons for your or your problem that you're looking for, and put that up in the break room with a magic marker and say, the, say to your building, we have an issue with acquired pressure ulcers. These are some ideas we came up with why they happen. Take this marker and add your own idea. And this allows everyone to participate in the analysis of the problem, even if they're not part of the PIP team. Here's an example of a pressure ulcer root cause analysis. It's not necessarily all inclusive, but it certainly shows you um, some ideas of what can be on a fishbone diagram. Okay, so now you're going to take some action. You've had your root cause analysis. You deter you've completed your fishbone diagram. Now what am I going to do? Well, let me review the literature to see what some best practices are. Did we you know, what are some best practices on dealing with um, the problem that we've come up with? And then let's have the PIP team select what we want to work on. If we came up with 50 reasons, as we saw in the fishbone diagram before, of why we might have pressure ulcers, it's really hard to implement a plan to change 50 items. But what we can do is pick two or three of those items that we want to do. We're going to plan. We're going to look at our fishbone. We're going to do those two or three items. And then we're going to go back and study them and say, did those two or three items make a difference? OK, it seemed like these did, but we're still not moving where we want to do. Let's change them up. Let's add something different. We're going to act and then go back to our PDSA again. Consider also uh, piloting this on maybe just a wing or a unit before you go through the entire house. It's a lot easier to train. 20 staff members than 200 staff members. Here are some different uh, corrective actions that you take. Um, obviously, training and education is something that we do every time that we have a problem. But the more you can get to systemic change and process change, the better off you're going to be in correcting the issue that you found. So our facility did a uh, PIP regarding pressure ulcers. We realized that we had a, um, an issue with acquired pressure ulcers. So we got our PIP team together, the wound care physician, the director of nursing. Um, we were very lucky to have a very involved wound care physician who was just as interested as we were in finding out what was going on. The administrator, the wound care team, uh, unit managers. But then we also decided to have the CNAs present because, again, if we have pressure ulcers that are acquiring in the building, it usually, not has, it usually doesn't have much to do with the wound care team. It's usually what's going on at the bedside. And then dietary and social services. Um, oftentimes, that development of a pressure ulcer is the springboard to having the conversation with the family about end-of-life care. We did a fishbone and a root cause analysis. And what we discovered was that there was really a problem with communication. Not all the CNAs were aware of who on their team was really the highest risk for developing the pressure ulcer, as well as who had wounds. Now, if you ask the CNAs at the beginning of this project who was high risk for pressure ulcers, they'd say, well, all of my patients are high risk for pressure ulcers. 
And at some level, again, very true. But you have some patients that are much, much higher risk. And how do we communicate that to our CNA? And how do we communicate that to the CNA, not only that work today, 7 to 3, who always has that same shift, but the float pool CNA who works on Sunday night. So we really worked hard with our communication strategy. We came up with some um, tools for the CNAs to use. And we looked at our facility acquired pressure ulcers and worsening pressure ulcers. And we knew that we had made a turn in our pressure ulcer issue when instead of the wound care team and the wound care physician talking about high-risk patients and what we could do to help them, it was the CNAs and the unit managers who were able to lead that discussion. And after doing this for several weeks, we came up with zero acquired pressure ulcers. And at that point, the wound care physician was able to step back, the DO and an administrator were able to step back, and the PIP team really was handed off to the wound care nurses, treatment nurses, um, and, and unit staff to really manage this going forward. Um, and it really was um, a very nice example of how the entire interdisciplinary team got involved to solve what many people would uh, construe as a nursing problem. So the quality rewards are really the fact that we are able to give those um, patients and residents entrusted to our care continuous quality care. It's an opportunity for you as an organization to have a quality process not only at the administration level, but something that all your staff can talk about and all your staff can embrace as we move forward. The caregivers and the line staff become active members of the quality team. And at the end of the day, we're developing quality of life and quality care to the residents um, that we've been given the opportunity to serve. And that is, at the end of the day, why we all went into long-term care. Wow. Well, Michelle, thank you. Thank you for bringing this material to life and helping us understand how to get the best out of QAPI in, in our settings. Um, we appreciate your comments today, as also from Ann Schurd. Thank you for helping us understand the landscape from the CMS perspective of QAPI. Um, what we wanted to point out to you next in your handout um, are the references that we used to put this presentation together for you. And you notice that this is heavily dominated from the CMS website. So it's a really good place to look and also a good place to sign up for our QAPI alerts. Additionally, we've put together for you some wound and skin care resources. And lastly, what we wanted to do is thank our sponsor today, Wound Rounds. Uh, wound Rounds is the uh, point of care wound management and prevention solution. And many facilities that implement Wound Rounds uh, report that they're delivering better wound care in less time and reporting other financial, economic, and uh, resident outcome data. So we're just so, pr so thrilled today that Wound Rounds could make this education available to you. And for those of you who are nurses, and nurses who are registered for this webinar um, on, on or before July 25th of 2013, we want you to be aware that you'll be receiving an email from Wound Rounds with information on how to take the post-test and the webinar evaluation, which are part of the requirements for your receiving continuing education units. If you're viewing this webinar on demand after July 25th, we, we want to let you know that we continue to offer additional webinars at Wound Rounds. Many of them also provide continuing education units. So please continue to watch the, web, the Wound Rounds website at www.woundrounds.com and look at the Learn page for our upcoming webinar schedule and how you can get continuing education units going forward. And also see our vast archive of other webinars that have been done in the past that are available on demand for your viewing. So at this point in the webinar, what I'd like to do is turn the floor over to our participants and get some good Q&A going. Our faculty members have agreed to stay on and take several questions. So what I'd like to do now is take our first question. And answer it. I think this is a good one for you to answer. We have a participant asking us, what, what is the time frame for QAPI? When must my facility be up and running with the QAPI program? And you want to answer that? Sure, Deb. Thanks. Uh, I would say now. Get started now. 
We don't know for sure when the requirements are going to hit. Um, we're anticipating somewhere in the first quarter of 2014, seeing as how the demonstration project will wrap up, and they need some time to collate the information that is being collected during that demonstration problem project. Um, but we want to get in the practice of doing this now. So I would start your program now, and uh, stay tuned to the CMS website for the final deadline. We never know when those are going to pop up on us, so we want to be prepared as they come down the line. Thank you, Anne. I guess there's no time like the present, right? Correct. <laughs> Our next question involves the role of the medical director, which I know that we, we spoke about at some length in this webinar. But this question um, is, is asking, how to engage a medical director who largely we have not had a close working relationship with? What, what, what can we do about getting him engaged in the quality process? I thought this might be a good one for you, Michelle. Um, absolutely. The first thing that I would do is sit down with your medical director and give them a copy of QAPI at a glance. That really explains what the facility's responsibility is as well as the medical director's responsibility. There may be some medical directors who are currently practicing out there that decide that QAPI really isn't something that they're interested in doing, and, and that's really okay. But we need to have a conversation with our medical director, explain QAPI at a glance, and then really set our facility expectations, and then determine, again, with the medical director, if this is something that is um, that they would like to participate in, or if maybe um, there's other opportunities for that physician in your organization. Michelle, thank you. Thank you for that answer. We have another question about how to best handle the handoffs that occur uh, between the team members. So this questioner notes that they have a very um, active and well-functioning QAA team and wondering how to leverage that QAA team into a QAPI team and how to really engage the whole building in the process. Since it sounds like, Michelle, this is exactly what, what you've driven at the new care organization, I'm wondering if you might want to share some insights as to how to get this to be, if you will, a team sport. One of the first things you need to do is make sure that you have champions from all areas of your building. Most of the time with the QAA team, it is mainly department heads. You may have a few scattered non-department heads, but it's really department heads. So the first thing you want to do is to get some champions from your line staff, to get some champions from your other departments, and get them involved in the process. Once you get these QIPI champions involved, they are going to be able to move the coffee process out to your floors, out to the rest of your staff. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. We have time for one last question, and this is on the subject of communication. I think we've heard how this is more than just uh, a matter of, of, of uh, making pens and t-shirts, but rather really how to drive information across the organization. So this questioner wants to know, um, they do a good job of communicating internally, but aren't quite sure how to engage the family and caregivers into the discussion. And I'm wondering, since this is something that New Care has excelled in, maybe, Michelle, you might want to speak to how do you drive family engagement? Well, the first thing you might want to look at is using your family council, if you have a family council. Um, introduce coffee at, you know, offer to come and introduce coffee at your next family council meeting. Um, introduce coffee at your resident council meeting. Oftentimes we have families that are involved in the resident council meeting. And if you have families that are very, very involved in your building, as we all do, maybe have individuals meetings with them. At, tell them about what your vision is with your coffee process. Tell them about what you're hoping to accomplish. And ask them what ideas they may have to help increase the quality of care in the building. By involving them in this process, you may be able to turn around a family who's not always happy with the care that's being done in your building to an active participant in increasing the quality of care in your building. Thank you. Well, to both of our presenters today, Michelle Sturkey and Ann Schurg, thank you so much on behalf of Wound Grounds for uh, participating in this webinar and sharing with us your, your knowledge in quality assurance and performance improvement. 
And lastly, a big thanks to Wound Rounds for sponsoring this webinar today and helping us to understand the importance of mining data-driven insights and using them to help us to strive and obtain goals in providing better patient care and outcomes. So thank you for everyone today. If you have questions for our presenters, you have their contact information here. Please feel free to reach out to them individually. With that, I'm Deb Kurtz, and on behalf of Wound Rounds, thanks for joining us today.